Uh, good morning. I'm Megan Smith um, here at Google, and uh, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Sue Black, who is joining us to talk today about Bletchley. But um, just quickly, uh, she's uh, on the faculty and a senior researcher at the University College of London. Um, she's also a member of the British Computer Society uh, as a council member, but also was the person who set up in 2001 BCS Women. Um, which has been a fabulous organization to help women pull, come into computer science. Also, um, I know you're a strategy member of ACM Women, and I know the ACM, the Associated Computing Machine, is uh, meeting this week uh, for the annual conference and the new Turing Awards and things, and so it sort of ties into Bletchley, given that uh, Alan Turing was there. Um, I know that the UK Foreign Secretary has a group on freedom of expression that you participate in, so thank you for that. And uh, also recently, Sue founded um, GoTo Foundation, the, um, which ha there's a wonderful, in the invite for the Tech Talk, there's a wonderful story in the BBC video of these seven-year-olds uh, using Raspberry Pi and Scratch and beginning to program and really sort of getting what this is all about. And the GoTo Foundation is really um, to bring in maybe, at the, and you can say some about that after the Bletchley, um, which would be great, uh, to bring young people or all people into CS. And I know that you had originally studied other things and then later came to computer science. So I know that that's near and dear to your heart of like getting more people into tech and in the CS world. Uh, the last thing I'd add is, um, IT Pro Magazine recently selected Dr. Black for a Tech Hero Award, and they said uh, of the UK leadership, we looked to Sir Tim, Dr. Black, and the other tech leaders for inspiration. So thank you so much for your amazing work to make people conscious of Letchley. And uh, you know, it was really falling into disrepair, and um, Sue visited and became instrumental in, in kind of getting the momentum going to, to what's happened now. And I remember just the last thing, um, as part of her uh, enthusiasm, I was at the Silicon Valley Comes to the UK events, um, which we do every fall where 40-odd Silicon Valley folks um, of all different types show up in the UK, and we do probably about 50 events with the UK techies and others from Parliament, Cambridge, Oxford, London, with startups and, and uh, everybody, students. And we were lucky to, I was lucky to meet Dr. Black at um, Nesta, which is their industry organization, and you came up and said, I need your help. The Turing papers are going up for Christie auction, and we need to keep them and get them for Bletchley Park so that we can all share in them. And so we, Google, were lucky to participate in that because of Sue telling us about it and her leadership. And the papers are now at Bletchley Park, and they're amazing, and you should go see them. So Dr. Black. Thank you very much, Megan. Wow, what an intro. <laughs> um, so I'm a, a computer science academic, as Megan was saying. I've taught computer science for uh, probably nearly 20 years now. And um, my first degree is computer science, and then I've got a PhD in software engineering. Um, outside of my, kind of like my regular job, so, so that, was, that was my work. But I'm also a very passionate campaigner. And um, when I see an issue somewhere, I like to try and do something about it. So kind of running along with my CS academic career, I've also been campaigning on issues around uh, computer science. And so first of all, that was the kind of in the women in tech space, setting up BCS Women. Um, and then uh, later on, it's been uh, mainly focused on helping Bletchley Park. So if you recognize these pictures, here's the mansion house at Bletchley Park and also a, uh, a photo of Hut 6 at Bletchley Park. So who here has been to Bletchley Park? Cool, that's about half the audience. I'm happy to, <laughs> that's, that's a very good result. Um, <laughs> and who here is on Twitter? Because I'm going to be talking about Twitter quite a bit as well. Anybody? Oh, maybe this is the wrong place to ask. <laughs> Who's on Google Plus? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Um, so Bletchley Park, the site, used to be about 52 acres, uh, which was very large. It's now about 26 acres, um, which is still large. There's the mansion house there that you can see. There are lots of um, huts that were used by the code breakers and buildings that have been renovated and some, as you can see here with Hut 6, that hasn't as yet been renovated. Um, so as, as the people that have been there know, uh, Bletchley Park is quite close to London. 
um, is actually in between Oxford and Cambridge, and it's on a direct uh, train line from London. So it's uh, a great place to visit if you're in London and only 36 minutes away. So a quick brief history of Bletchley Park. So I was with Sir John in the Computing History Museum um, the other night for a dinner and uh, he was making the case that it's argu arguably one of the, the most important sites of the 20th century because it brings together the whole World War II story about people coming together and making an impact um, and making the world a better place. But it's also the birthplace of one of the first computers, the first um, programmable electronic computer, Colossus, which was um, invented by Tommy Flowers and taken up to Bletchley Park as part of the code-breaking effort. So you can see here an Enigma machine. And um, when uh, they were trying to crack Enigma, um, the chances, it was, it was calculated that the chances of cracking Enigma were, you can see the number on the screen there, 158 million, million, million to one. So it was a tough job. You know, it wasn't something that was uh, easy or straightforward. Um, and one of the things that um, I think has kind of mitigated against Bletchley Park being well known is the fact that Churchill ordered at the end of the war that um, all the machines be cut up and buried. And also everyone was sworn to secrecy and wasn't allowed to talk about it for at least 30 years afterwards. So um, I think that's one of the reasons that, that it hasn't been so well known, that we haven't been talking about it. I mean, we, are, we have been recently, but for a long time, no one talked about it at all. So my, my first trip up to Bletchley Park, I was a computer science academic. I set up this group called BCS Women, which was to uh, support and connect women working in technology. Uh, and as chair of the group, I was invited up to Bletchley Park. So when I went up there the first time, I knew, th I knew the name Bletchley Park, I knew the kind of home of the code breakers kind of thing, but I didn't really know anything much else about it. So I went up for a meeting, and at the end of the meeting, I thought, right, now's my chance to go and have a good look around and see what's here. So I started walking around and wandered into one of the huts. And uh, in there, I saw this team of guys at the end of the hut fiddling around with some um, very complicated but very interesting looking uh, machinery. So I went over to talk to them and asked what they were doing. And it was a guy called John Harper who was uh, leading a team of people rebuilding the bomb machine. Um, because of course, all these machines had been destroyed. And so more recently, um, great teams of enthusiasts of, of uh, taken years, I think it took 12 years to rebuild the bomb machine. Um, so they've rebuilt these machines. So I had a chat with him and said, what are you doing? So he told me all about the bomb. And then he said to me, what are you doing here? So I said, oh, well, I'm representing this group for women in tech. So um, he said, well, did you know that more than half the people that worked here were women? So I was like, no, I had, I had no idea about that at all. Um, I just kind of had in my head, it would be kind of lots of guys in their 50s with tweed jackets kind of sitting around smoking pipes and doing the Times crossword. That was kind of, kind of sort of, you know, the image I had in my head of the people that work there. So to find out that more than half of them were women was a real surprise for me. So I said, how many people worked here? So he said, more than 10,000. So I was like, I really couldn't believe that because again, in my head, it was like enough people to fit in a reasonably small room. I, I had no clue. Uh, that it was more than 10,000 people. So again, I was really surprised. And so that day I kind of went away thinking, I've, you know, I'm a woman in tech. I'm trying to connect and promote women in tech. Here's a great story. 5,000 women working on this site. Nobody knows about it. Well, obviously some people, but it's not in the general consciousness. So I went away thinking I've got to do something about it. Um, and uh, what I did was uh, try to raise some money for a, an oral history project to record uh, the memories of the women that worked there. So here, here's some of the, the women that we talked to. On the bottom right, there's uh, Ruth Bourne and Jean Valentine, who both worked there as teenagers. And um, talking to Ruth, it's, it's just, um, 
it's amazing to think what they did and at what age they did it. So Ruth said that when she was in sixth form at school, so that's like maybe between age 16 to 18, she left sixth form and decided to sign up for the Navy. Uh, so she went along to the Navy office and signed up. Um, and then shortly after that, she was taken up to Scotland for two weeks training. So, you know, a 17-year-old going away from home, two weeks training. And then um, the, the group of girls that they were really um, were asked whether they wanted to, to um, work for SDX. So they asked, what is SDX? And they were told it's special duties X. And they weren't told any more than that. All they were told was that um, uh, they would, there wouldn't be any promotion, it would be low pay, long hours, and once they were in, they couldn't get out, and they were sworn to secrecy. So can you just imagine being a 17-year-old girl and being told that? I mean, for me, I'd be, yes, yeah, please, can I do it? It just sounds um, very mysterious and attractive. Um, and so, so they signed up for it, and they... they um, they signed their names and pledged uh, secrecy and went along. And uh, she said on the first day that she, and so that turned out to be going to Bletchley Park, but they didn't know till they got there. Um, when she went for her first day of training at Bletchley Park, um, you know, they still didn't quite know what was going along and uh, going on. And she went along to the hut that they were going to be trained in. And uh, she said there were armed guards on the door. So then she realized it was very serious. Um, what they were doing. But, you know, just imagine being a 17-year-old girl in that kind of situation with lots of other girls and going along and being armed guards in the, on the door and then going into this, what she said was a very dingy hut with lots and lots of machines and they were working with the bomb machines. That's what they were being trained on. Um, uh, so long hours in dingy huts with lots of noise and she said it just smelt of oil all the time. Um, so, um, you know, that's just one s snippet of, of one person's story. There's just so many amazing stories uh, of the women of Bletchley Park. So, um, some great stories of women at Bletchley Park. Uh, this is uh, an article about the launch of the Women of Station X project, which is the project um, that I was talking about, the oral history project. So, so I gave my little talk, the, the stuff that I've just told you about getting involved and the women and what we were doing. And uh, that's Simon Greenish in the uh, picture with me up there, who's, who's the, who was the CEO of Bletchley Park at the time. So I gave my talk and then he came up to give his talk and said that... Um, he, uh, uh, that Bletchley Park was teetering on a financial knife edge um, and that they weren't sure if there was an epidemic. At the time, there was a lot of talk of uh, swine flu epidemics. And he said if there was something like a swine flu e epidemic, uh, he was worried that the number of visitors would drop and uh, the main money coming into Bletchley Park was from people visiting. And so if the, the uh, number of people dropped, then their income was dropped and he was really worried that Bletchley Park would have to close so, um, so I kind of thought to myself, you know, I had the, we were sitting there and it was just going round and round in my head, well, that's not right, you know, that, that can't happen. So um, a few weeks later, I was invited up to a reception at Bletchley Park and that was the first time that I did a proper tour. So before I'd just gone into one hut on my own and talked to a few people. So this time there was a proper organized tour and I went round the whole place. And then I just had this moment on, on the uh, tour where the tour was being given by a veteran, so someone who worked there. We were standing in a group outside uh, this hut. So here's a picture of it here on the top um, left, hut six. So we were just standing there looking at this hut. And he was telling us about all the major achievements that happened in that hut, you know, from things that happened in that hut, the code breaking that, that occurred there. And, and the ramifications of that in terms of the Battle of the Atlantic and all the amazing stuff that was achieved because of the code breaking um, that happened at Bletchley Park. And I just had this kind of um, moment of epiphany when I, I just thought, this place can't close. I've got to try and do something about it. So at the time, I was um, head of a CS department at the University of Westminster. 
And so I was on an email list for all the CS heads and profs in the country, in the UK. So I emailed everybody and asked them to sign a petition, which was on the 10 Downing Street website, asking uh, to save Bletchley Park. And um, after sending that email around, I checked the petition a few hours later and found that loads of really, to me, very famous CS profs uh, from the UK had signed the petition. So I thought, okay, it's not just me. Other people feel the same way. Um, so, um, so that was great. So I, I talked to my colleague, John Harper, who's in the top photo there with me on our trip to Bletchley Park. I talked to him and said, what else can we do? We, we need to kind of get more recognition uh, for this. And he said, why don't we write a letter to the Times? So I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. So John wrote a letter. We sent it around the heads and profs, and within a few days, uh, almost 100 of them had signed it. And uh, I then thought, I need to um, get more publicity for this. So I contacted all the journalists uh, that I knew. So I set up a blog, too. Uh, so this is my blog. Um, I contacted all the journalists that I knew, saying, I think I've got a story. We need to um, save Bletchley Park. And... Um, uh, and the upshot of that was that um, Rory Keflin Jones, who's the BBC technology correspondent, got in touch and uh, asked me to go up to Bletchley Park with him and um, filmed me up there uh, saying it was a disgrace and we needed to do something about it. So that's four years ago. That's July 2008. And uh, so that went out on the BBC News and around the world, in fact, which was a bit of a shock for me because I got people, uh, friends in uh, the US and Canada and Australia saying, we just saw you on TV, why are you, why are you on TV? Um, so that was quite funny because I had no clue that that would happen. Um, so, so that message went around, I got lots of emails um, coming in and so there was a massive spike of interest which was wonderful. Um, but, and that was great. But the thing is with, with news is it has to be new, right? So how, if you're trying to raise awareness of something, how do, you, how do you keep it up in people's consciousness all the time rather than, you know, big spikes um, and nothing in between? So after that, I was kind of looking around for ways to try and do that, to try and keep it in the, in the public consciousness. Um, and so uh, around Christmas that year, I started playing around with Twitter. Uh, and, and sort of gradually started to realise that actually maybe that was a way to try and find people that would be interested in Bletchley Park and kind of start creating a community of interest around it. So I started using Twitter and... Oops. Sorry, I started using Twitter and um, uh, within a few weeks, various people got in touch with me saying that they wanted to help. So this guy on the left here is Captain Jerry Roberts, who's one of the code breakers at Bletchley Park. He's one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Um, he got into, he's one of the people that got in touch with me after the BBC News article. And, uh, and since then, I've become friends with him and his family. Um, and he's just uh, one of those really incredible people, uh, that you, one of the few people that you meet in your life who's just really amazing. So I think he's now, he's over 90 now and uh, still going strong and his mental faculties are just uh, incredible. It completely put me to shame. Um, so the people that uh, contacted me through Twitter are these guys uh, at the top here um, who are sizing on documentary on Twitter um, and uh, Jamila at the bottom. So they, I, I was, uh, sorry, they were interested in Bletchley Park. I wanted to help them to find out more. So Jerry, Captain Jerry Roberts was giving a talk at UCL in, in the January. So we all went along to that. And, uh, you know, that, that really kind of inspired everybody and got them even more interested in going to Bletchley Park. So I think the day after that, we all went up to Bletchley Park. And um, uh, while we were there, well, it was kind of like my first experience of taking other people up there. So I'd gone up there and had just kind of just got very excited about the whole place and how wonderful it was but this was the the first time that I'd taken other people up there too and they felt exactly the same way so so that that was kind of a moment that helped me to realize that if you get people to visit they're kind of bought in because they see the place they see why it's important and um they, they kind of uh, get bitten by the Bletchley Park bug 
So we went up there and they set up Bletchley Park on Twitter and talked to them about social media and took loads of photos and then just started spreading the word out to their communities. So after that visit, um, you know, that kind of started a, a kind of chain reaction of uh, building a community. But I was, again, I was always looking around for ways to try and um, bring more people in. Uh, and so one evening there was um, Stephen Fry. Do, does everyone know who Stephen Fry is? Yes, good, okay. Uh, so Stephen Fry <laughs> um, posted a photo of him uh, stuck in a lift in London and tweeted, we can't get out, can anyone help? <laughs> so they, they'd uh, pressed the alarm and, and they were still stuck. So I saw that photo of him and I thought, oh, well, Stephen Fry, he might be interested in Bletchley Park. Um, so I googled Stephen Fry Bletchley Park to see um, if he was and found some quotes from him saying stuff like, um, if Bletchley Park were to close, it would be like Nelson's column falling down. So I thought, okay, so he feels the same way as well. Um, so I sent him several um, direct messages on Twitter because luckily he was following me saying, please help Bletchley Park. You know, if you were to get involved, that would make a massive difference. Um, and that was kind of late one night and I kind of went to bed and thought, oh, well, you know, he probably, he's got, at the time he had 220,000 followers. So I thought, well, he's, he must get messages from people all the time asking him to do stuff. He probably won't see it, but I, I gave it a go, went to bed. And then I was sitting at work the next morning and um, I got an email which was saying that he'd posted, um, say, you know, we need to save Bletchley Park and uh, uh, appointing people at my blog. So... I'd set up my blog and it was getting about 50 hits a day, which I thought was okay. Um, and then Stephen Fry tweeted it and it got 8,000 that day. So it kind of shows you the, uh, the difference if uh, you get the right people involved, I guess. So you can see on the screen, this is uh, my, uh, oh gosh, I can't, see it. I can't see it. I think it's my, you see the line going up. I think I was like the most retweeted person on Twitter or something that day, or the most mentioned person on Twitter that day. Um, and of course, that, that will never happen again. Um, but we're talking about three and a half years ago. But it was amazing because, you know, it, it, that kind of taught me the lesson that if you find someone that is interested and is very influential, it can make a massive difference to what you're doing. So remember, you know, like my background is not in campaigning really, it's, it's all in like teaching uh, computer science. So I was kind of learning this stuff as I was going along. And um, so when Bletchley Park saw that um, Stephen Fry tweeted, they phoned me up and said, invite him up for lunch, invite him up for lunch. So we had all these kind of frantic conversations and uh, messages going between us with me inviting um, Stephen Fry up for lunch. So a few months later, um, when he was back from filming in New Zealand, Stephen Fry came up to Bletchley Park for the day and we just had the most um, amazing day. And, and one of the great things that happened that day was that there was um, uh, one of the women that had worked at Bletchley Park when she was a teenager had come back for the first time since then to visit Bletchley Park. And we just, I think, happened to overhear that. And so there was just this amazing conversation between Stephen Fry, who's really tall, and this lady who was really small, I don't know, it was just wonderful that kind of him asking her all about what she'd done there. And, you know, she was just, uh, it, it was just wonderful. I can't, I can't even explain it, but it was a great moment. So here's some of the code breakers uh, and people that worked at Bletchley Park now. So one of the things that has been great for me to um, be part of is going to the annual reunion. So I went uh, for dinner with some of the people that worked at Bletchley Park um, a couple of years ago because they have a, in September every year, there's an annual reunion. And um, I was sat at a table with what looked like, well, what were lots of old ladies, you know, women in their 80s, um, but they'd worked at Bletchley Park. So I was kind of desperate to talk to them about what their time there was like. And uh, we talked about the work stuff and that was interesting. But then I said, so what did you do outside of work? You know, if you've got any good stories about stuff that happened. And uh, so one of them said, do you remember the time when we nicked the vicar's bicycle to go to a dance? And I thought, yeah, this is more like the kind of story that I'm interested in because it kind of gives you a rounded picture of, of what their life was like there. You know, it was hard and, and they were working under 
extreme conditions and they weren't allowed to talk about anything. But, you know, they were teenage girls and they still had fun. And then another one said that um, they were billeted out. Some of the girls were billeted out at Woburn Abbey nearby. So it was a big group of, um, of girls. And um, they, in the summer, they used to sunbathe topless on the roof of Woburn Abbey. Um, and apparently the local RAF pilots got into lots of trouble because they would be flying over and they'd swoop down low to try and get a look <laughs> at the girls sunbathing on the roof. And um, I, th I think to start with, they, did, they couldn't understand why all the planes were swo swooping low over Woburn Abbey because it didn't make sense. And then they found out that that was why. So I thought that was quite a nice story as well because they were still teenagers. And, you know, the guys flying the planes were, you know, they were all very young, I think a lot of them. So, um, one of the things I really wanted to do was um, obviously to raise awareness, um, but there's various ways to do that. I come from an academic background, and I'd been to a conference called Museums and the Web, um, presenting about uh, women and the web uh, a couple of years earlier. And so it dawned on me that maybe a good thing to do would be to try and connect Bletchley Park into the sort of museums and the web community, because there's lots of museums and an online presence. So uh, with uh, Kelsey Griffin, who's Director of Operations at Bletchley Park, and uh, Professor Jonathan Bowen, we wrote a paper called Can Twitter Save Bletchley Park? So this is two years ago now. Um, and uh, we wrote the paper about how we'd been using social media and the history of Bletchley Park and all that kind of stuff. And we sent our, um, our paper in and then found out a few months later that it had been accepted. So when it was accepted, I then realized we hadn't, the, the conference was in Denver. We had no money to go to the conference. And I'd now set up a situation where Bletchley Park were potentially going to have to pay several thousand pounds to go um, to a conference. So I thought, OK, no, that's, that's not good. I'm not happy with that. What can I do? So I was kind of wondering what to do, wondering aloud on Twitter, as I tend to do. Um, and various people who, who've been very supportive in the campaign said, well, why don't you set up a, a Just Giving page, which is like a crowdfunding page, and just ask people for money for you to go and, um, and give the paper. So um, I was persuaded that that was a good idea. So I set one up, and within, uh, I think, two weeks, we raised all the money. So that was a massive surprise, a very, very pleasant surprise for me, in that it just showed that the community really cared about Bletchley Park and really wanted um, Bletchley Park to be able to go and tell their story uh, to the community. So that was another one of those moments where we just got this amazing feedback um, from people which showed that they were really on board with wanting um, Bletchley Park to be the place that it should be. So here's some of the uh, people that gave the money. Um, these are their Twitter avatars. And uh, I always like to say a special um, thank you to Mr. Grasshead at the top in the middle, um, because he was the biggest single donor. <laughs> and uh, I know who he is, but you don't. <laughs> so that kind of brings me on to the Turing papers. So like Megan was saying at the beginning, um, uh, I, you know, I was always looking around for opportunities. Um, an amazing guy called Gareth Harfacre had set up a Just Giving uh, fund to uh, raise money from the public to buy the Turing papers for Bletchley Park. So the Turing papers had come up for auction, and they were um, priced at between three hundred and five hundred thousand pounds. So they were up for auction at Christie's in November, not last year, but the year before. Um, and uh, Gareth had done an amazing job because he'd managed in a few days to get £20,000 from the public, which is just incredible. Um, I'd kind of been keeping an eye on what he was doing and thinking whether I could help in any way, and if I could, how that would be. Then I went to a talk at Nesta and uh, heard Megan speaking and saw she was from Google and thought, oh, maybe I should just go and chat to Megan and see if Google are interested in, in helping Bletchley Park to buy the Turing papers. So um, I talked to Megan, 
she said she was interested and that I should send an email. And uh, so I went home and sent an email. And, um, and then I think the next, that night or the next night, Simon uh, Meacham uh, contacted me via Twitter and said, I'm from Google and I, I want to help Bletchley Park. So I said, oh, well, I've just been talking to someone from Google today. And uh, Simon said, well, send me, send me the same email. So I did that. And the next few days were absolutely amazing because I don't know what happened exactly, but I do know that Simon and Megan managed to get $100,000 in a very short amount of time um, to help Bletchley Park purchase the Turing papers. Um, so I'll probably never know <laughs> too much about that, but I had lots of excited phone calls from Simon over the weekend uh, with, with various um, uh, stages that had been reached. Uh, and uh, well, that, that was uh, a very exciting weekend. Anyway, so, so the next week, um, the Turing papers were up for auction, I think on the Tuesday. So I'd only spoken to Megan, I think on the Thursday before, so it all happened very, very quickly. Um, and um, so I went down to the auction, and I don't know if you've ever been to an auction at a big auction house, but it's a very kind of um, exciting place. It's very buzzy, all this money changing hands. And um, I don't know if you can see anyone you recognize up there apart from Alan Turing, uh, but um, Steve Wozniak was there as well because they were selling an apple. Um, so I walked in and there, there was kind of loads of press around the back and then Steve was next at the back and I don't know, it was very, um, it was like an electric atmosphere. So I sat there for a while and uh, there were all these lots uh, being sold and then after about half an hour um, the Turing papers came up um, as the current lot. And uh, so I knew that Bletchley Park had put in a bid of about £100,000 because they had the £20,000 from Gareth's Just Giving and the £100,000 from Google. And I knew uh, that the guide price was three hundred to 500000 So I didn't quite know what was going to happen, but I knew Bletchley Park had bid 100000 or thereabouts. So the lot comes up and the, the auctioneer said, and we start the bidding at £165,000. So I thought, oh no, we've actually parked only bid 100000 so we're kind of out of the water already. Um, and then things, people were bidding, and in about 10 or 15 seconds, it was all over, and I didn't really know what had happened. And it turned out that the papers had not met the guide price. So that was it, and they just went on to, to the next lot. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't quite appreciate what that meant. Um, but I did know that I was supposed to be going to meet Simon Meacham for a cup of tea in, uh, at Google in Victoria. So I just started walking down there uh, to meet Simon. And um, uh, yeah, so we met up for the first time in person and that was cool. And then Megan was there as well. So, so that was great. And we had a chat about everything that had happened. And what happened uh, was they'd not met the guide price and basically various people working together um, especially uh, Simon Greenish, the previous CEO of Bletchley Park, managed to get the, the rest of the money from other places and um, a few months later, the Turing papers went to Bletchley Park. So that was wonderful. Um, it was great to, to see them there and you can go and see them there now. They're, um, there's a whole Turing exhibition of which uh, the Turing papers uh, play a fundamental role and so that, that was great, that was great. Something that took quite a long time to make happen, but lots of different people working together in different ways made it happen, and, and that was wonderful. So one of the, the funny stroke cool things that's happened to me is that um, you know, various people have kind of got in touch who are interested, uh, have kind of seen my Women in Tech campaigning and Bletchley Park campaigning and I've, I've got in touch wanting to talk to me. And one of those is um, Robert Llewellyn, who has this uh, program called Carpool. And it's really funny, because I didn't actually know what Carpool was till I came to, uh, to uh, Silicon Valley last week. <laughs> so I've known about, I've known this program was called Carpool, I had a vague idea of what it was, but I didn't really know what it was till I drove in the Carpool lane um, last week. So, uh, you know, you learn something every day. Um, so he has this program where uh, he takes someone in his car from A to B, and so you have to decide where you want to go to and from. So we had this long email discussion about where we should go, because I had to choose a place, and then eventually it dawned on me 
could he take me to Bletchley Park? I don't know why I hadn't thought of that straight away. I don't know why he hadn't thought of that straight away. So we had this amazing day where he um, drove me up to Bletchley Park. Simon Greenish gave, gave us a whistle-stop tour, including a quick sausage and mash in uh, Hut 4, uh, and, um, and then back down to London. But it was, it was kind of... So it's another person in the UK, anyway, who's, who's well-known, who's uh, kind of techie, who is showing their support for um, Bletchley Park, which is wonderful. So some other people that you might have heard of uh, have been up to Bletchley Park recently. Um, so uh, Queen Elizabeth and Duke of Edinburgh um, came up there in July 2011. So I don't know if I can say I've met the Queen because I was about six metres away from her. Um, but the greatest thing for me about that day was this which was that Captain Jerry Roberts, one of the significant code breakers, and who he has done lots of campaigning as well to try and raise awareness of everything that happened there. So Jerry got to meet the Queen um, and have a chat with her and tell her about what he did. And for me, that was just absolutely wonderful that he get that recognition. So last summer, so, so since, since um, Megan and uh, Simon kind of kick-started the whole Google involvement with Bletchley Park. They, they've really worked hard to, to um, work together with Bletchley Park to make things happen. And one of the things that, that um, Google have made happen uh, was a summer garden party at Bletchley Park last year, which was absolutely wonderful because it was kind of a really nice way to sort of celebrate the tech community and Bletchley Park and just all the kind of, it's very hard to put into words, but, but just um, just that, that things, that, that Bletchley Park was going places and that, that Google were involved helping out and that it was a cool place to be and major stuff happened there and we were all kind of um, celebrating that. So that was wonderful. And um, here's uh, a photo of, of me and uh, Simon Meacham and Alan Turing. Uh, at the bottom, but that was really nice because that was the first time from um, Simon getting involved at the beginning uh, and helping with the purchase of the Turing papers to them actually being at Bletchley Park and then us actually being there together at the same time and seeing the Turing papers. So, so that was a great moment um, for me. I, it was, it was just lovely. It kind of like um, that was like the end of that bit of the story or something because it, it worked. Um, since then, um, I've also, um, so Silicon Valley comes to the UK that Megan mentioned earlier is, uh, a great, uh, initiative, uh, from Silicon Valley, uh, taking entrepreneurs over to the UK. And that's how I met Megan in the first place. So as Megan was saying, when that happened last November, uh, Megan got in touch and said, we're going up to Bletchley Park tomorrow, do you want to come? So I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> so here are some um, pictures of um, uh, Megan and uh, Simon Greenish, the previous CEO, but along with Julie Hanna and Reid Hoffman and DJ Patil, who've been absolutely wonderful, along with Megan, in, in making things happen over here. And um, uh, the dinner that I was talking about uh, earlier this week with Sir John Scarlett at the Computer History Museum. They, they, they've worked amazingly to get some key people together to get them interested in Bletchley Park. So that's been kind of part of the continuing story and I'm um, uh, very grateful for that. So here's Sir John Scarlett speaking at the Computer History Museum this week. Um, he gave a great talk, I think, which really... Um, brought home the significance and importance of Bletchley Park. So John was uh, head of MI6 in the UK and is now chair of trustees at uh, Bletchley Park. And um, I think it's great that we're connecting with uh, the community over here in Silicon Valley and with the Computer History Museum. And uh, I think this is the start of, of a great uh, relationship. So back to Bletchley Park. This is a photograph that I took a few weeks ago inside Block D. Uh, and that's an amazing place. It's, it's a massive, massive uh, block. And uh, there are things in there like uh, there's a magistrate's court inside the block from the, I think, 1980s, which 
uh, is not used anymore. And um, you just kind of wander through the corridors and it's very, very evocative. You know, it kind of smells a bit damp and you can just almost hear the footsteps of people walking along there uh, many years ago. And so Simon Greenish, the previous CEO, is now retired and Ian Standen is uh, the new CEO at Bletchley Park. And uh, he's got a great uh, sense of, of mission and the importance of Bletchley Park. And he's going to see it into a very um, successful, I'm sure, future. Um, so he's looking for Bletchley Park to be uh, a world-class museum and heritage site and uh, kind of to show the world how important it was and kind of bring it back to its former glory. So the previous slide was uh, one of the blocks as it is now, but uh, Bletchley Park have great plans now for the future and uh, these renovations are starting now, are gonna continue over the next few years so that uh, in five to 10 years time, it'll be an absolutely amazing um, international heritage site and museum. And, um, but I would say, because I'm looking forward to those days, but at the same time, I kind of like it how it is now because it's very um, eccentric and looks a bit ramshackle. And I, I think what they're going to do is going to make it um, much better overall. But I, I, I'd encourage people to visit now so that you can see um, the difference between how it is now and how it will be. Uh, it's a great place now. It's going to be an even uh, better place in the future. So as, as to what you can do, so um, we've been talking about Bletchley Park today. Do check out their website, which is uh, bletchleypark.org.uk. If you go over to London, it's only 36 minutes on the train from central London, then it's over the road. Think about maybe if you're interested, how you could help bring attention or funds to Bletchley Park. If you are on Twitter, uh, do follow us on Twitter. And let's all work together to build um, a Bletchley Park for the future that recognizes the um, absolute international importance of the site. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Who put the artifacts uh, for auction? Oh, is the, is don't know. We Some, don't know. Someone that. in Canada. That's all I know. I, I know the. Um, I now know the uh, the guy that handled them, Julian Wilson at Christie's. So I keep asking him, but he won't tell me. <laughs> He's not allowed to tell me. So. Thank you. <laughs> what are the future plans for the site? Could you talk a little bit more about those? Um, are we? I wonder if you could talk a little more about the future plans for the site. Um, is the vision some kind of, you know, computer history museum type facility uh, there? And, you know, how would the funding model for that work um, over the long term? And Sue, one thing we should mention is the, the teams um, that came to visit this week went to the Computer History Museum here, which was terrific, and they have the Amazing Revolution exhibit that's the 2,000 years. Um, and what was so compelling during Sir John's uh, tour was to see the Manchester baby, which although the machines from Bletchley were um, destroyed because of Churchill, they wanted to save the intellectual property from getting other places, even though war had been won, um, the, the teams spun out. And so many of the leadership then went on to make Manchester baby and then many other uh, projects came from there. So that's kind of interesting. That's true. I also didn't mention that there were 300 US military based at Bletchley Park as well. So that, that's one of the key points in my talk that I forgot to mention being in the US. Um, but, you know, so there was a lot of collaboration going on. Um, in terms of uh, the future, the, the whole idea is to renovate the site um, in a way that kind of takes it back to 1940, which I think is absolutely the best thing to do. Because when, when I go there now, I've been there probably 50 times. Every time I walk past the gatehouse and walk on site, I just kind of get these tingles of, you know, it's kind of like walking back into the 1940s. And, and so the plan is to make it even more like that. So it really is like walking back into the 1940s, but at the same time, a state-of-the-art museum. 
And there's also the um, National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park, which is there now. And so that, that's uh, a museum, a bit like the Computer History Museum here, uh, which is on site there too. So there's the whole history of uh, computing too at Bletchley Park. Yeah, and yeah, and Colossus is working, so you can go and see uh, Colossus. In fact, there's a film at the Computer History Museum of Tony Sale, who led the rebuild of Colossus, talking about Colossus and showing Colossus in the Computer History Museum just down the road here. Yeah. Yes. So um, I, there's, I guess, various estimates out there for how. Um, how much longer it would have taken to uh, win World War II had this ever not existed? Yeah. Um, how how do they arrive at these estimates? I don't know how they arrive at them. I, but I do know that um, Harry Hinsley, who I think was a code breaker there and is a famous was a famous historian, um, said that it shortened the war by between two and four years. And at the time, about 11 million people a year were dying. So that's between 22 million and 44 million people. I mean, it's just unimaginable numbers of people. And um, just talking to Sir John the other day, he was saying that um, Eisenhower said that uh, the work done there shortened the war by many months. So, you know, it had a massive impact. I think it's, it's always hard, isn't it, to quantify what would have happened because you just don't know. But, but you know... It made a major difference. We, so, we, we do have a data point. That's the convoys. Is the what, sorry? The convoys. Yes. We do have okay. data points for the convoys. Okay. One of the things that Sir John spoke about at the museum was um, the U-boats and the Battle of the Atlantic. Yeah. And to that point, so there was a period of time that he said, and I'll get it wrong in a second, but there was a six-month period where we lost the codes and then we got them back. And the teams, the difference in being able to move at, you know, to get to the U-boats was really significant. Um, the other one that he talked about, the contribution had to do with North Africa and really reducing the supply line access um, as they were moving towards Cairo and, and preventing a lot of that, which was huge. Um, and the amazing thing is that the, the Germans had some suspicions, but not really, they really didn't know, mm. the Nazis, um, which is <laughs> really amazing. And we often, you know, one of the questions at the museum was, you know, what, 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 why didn't they suspect or what happened? And one of the, the questions is actually a humanity question in some ways for me, having visited and soon I have talked about this before, which is the Nazis, their fundamental idea was this perfection idea. And they were systematically eliminating anyone from the society, you know, that was not matching this ideal. So if you were an intellectual, if you were um, from particular groups, you just, the misfits please go away, you know, in this ideal group. So they have this idea that perfection was achievable in some way. And so their belief that Enigma was uncrackable is interesting. And what's really striking about Bletchley is it was all hands on deck. You know, whoever, whatever talent, and Churchill located it very strategically right outside of London and right between Cambridge and Oxford to try to pull, pull the mathematical talent from both and did that. And so even though, you know, in the 1950s context, you still had, you know, gender disparity or um, Turing was not out as, as a gay man, but um, you had the, you know, to the Steve Jobs commercial, the misfits, the crazies who, you know, often changed the world. And they were there, and in fact, to the point where in one of the huts, there's this fabulous little bay window and one of the stories is um, about this engineer who needed windows around him to work. And so, you know, making that accommodation. Whereas I don't think the Nazi world would have accommodated that talent to let that talent be so effective. So having half women and half men and, and just whoever was going to show up to execute against this is a really amazing sign. Thanks, Megan. I'm just sneaking on for a moment because I, I read something recently as well that said that the Germans, or Nazis at the time, when interviewed, uh, said they did know that Enigma was breakable. They, they, they knew that it was breakable, but they assumed you'd need a whole machine, a room full <laughs> of a, a machine the size of a room to do that. That's never going to happen. <laughs> so that was quite interesting. There was, there's one more thing. I mean, if, if you want to sort of get into, into the world of uh, those days, a good book to read is Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomica, 
which I mean it is fiction, but there's a lot of you know, like science and historical detail from there. And to speak to that, you know, like it's unbreakable or not, you know, like one of the things is you know, like if you break the code, you also need to be able to hide the knowledge that the code is broken, and that's what they actually did. I mean, you know, like they 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 were very careful, you know, like to to fall within the Gaussian, which is like explained in the book. So I, w I won't talk more about it. Yeah, you you are totally right there. Um, it there were certain. There's a certain arrogance, of course, that you referred to, Megan, where it, it helps not to send every message with Heil Hitler at the start. Right. <laughs> Since you mentioned sort of physically being there, you know what it's like, and um, we got to visit with you, which was amazing, and there's this one point on the tour, you go past the mansion house and you're kind of near the gates, and you can, the, the tour guide mentions that up on the, the tower is where Station X was, um, and Station X is the na another name for Bletchley, and it's where the radio station was, and they quickly moved it because they didn't want to be discovered, but you can go inside of there, but what they then had to do was bring everything by motorbike, and so when mm. you're standing there, they kind of point at the gate and say, imagine 40 motorbikes an hour coming through this gate, each with a message, and cracking that, and years of that. It's yeah, just really an amazing image. And, you know, well, and the thing of it being in the dark, because there was blackout at night, right? So the motorbikes couldn't put any lights on, and there weren't any lights for Bletchley Park. And yet they were still having to, you know, I'm sure they weren't going very slowly, go along, you know, these alleyways and bringing the messages in. And uh, I'm sure there must have been accidents, and, you know, it, it wasn't... Um, straightforward. Yeah. So you, you notice the infectious enthusiasm. We've all become amateur historians <laughs> here. We, we, we sort of grabbing the mic, no, and this thing happened here, and then this thing, and I, I ended up going to the Imperial War Museum and also going to see uh, Winston Churchill's uh, war rooms, which is all sort of tied in. And at a time when Bletchley was building this computer technology, uh, you know, the, the room, that, and it was much bigger than a room, actually, with the bombs running and cracking things and later breaking the Lorenz cipher. You just start learning more and more and more. The Americans actually put a computer the size of a room into Churchill's toilet in the war rooms <laughs> so that it was secretly encrypting his phone calls back to, back to the States as well. You, you saw this, for us, computer stuff was happening there that I was not aware of before getting into this, and we've all sort of, it's infectious. We want to infect you with this infectious enthusiasm. Yeah, so go visit. Yeah, Everybody, a, go visit. Yeah, go visit. It has like an Apollo mission, you know, kind of feel to it, and uh, with such amazing, you know, consequence. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is uh, Churchill, the small group who kept it secret, um, and apparently there was at one point a long list of who knew and Churchill came and just crossed out all the names and Reed was saying, it's like he crossed out all the CCs, you know, I'm like <laughs> no one would be, you know, included in this, maybe five or six people knew and so it was kept so secret. Um, the other thing that I love is just being able to see the humanity of the different people who were there and, you know, Turing himself and the Hill exhibit, you know, his oars because he was a rower at Cambridge are there and, and uh, also, astoundingly, the 2009 apology from uh, the UK government for a treatment of Alan after, um, after the war uh, because homosexuality was so, so misunderstood then um, is amazing and in central display in the area about him, which is great um, for, for everybody to see. The thing that I loved walking in was uh, this young woman, or this older woman was there. And she revealed that she was five years old as the only kids on site. She, her twin sister, her older brother, and her little brother were all kids there. And uh, she was talking about um, next door, they lived in the stables. Next door was one of the groups um, with Denny, what's the name of the famous mathematician there? I can't Dilly remember. Knox. Dilly Knox. So Dilly Knox was in there. And she remembers her mother uh, talking to the kids saying, shh, the girls are working. The girls are working. <laughs> it's just such a visceral feeling of imagining all these mathematicians and talented people in Bletchley doing their things. So it was like 50% women, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah more. Good. Yeah. So, Sue. <laughs> Any other questions for Sue? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Go visit.